And this brings us to number two, the propounding of the point, and that in these words, God observes with the eye of approbation, such as engage and tie themselves to him. He looks with an approving eye upon this carefulness. For such an engagement of soul is, number one, needful, number two, helpful. Needful for the heart, helpful to our graces. The needfulness is evident. The heart is slow and subtle, backward and deceitful. Except to be drawn with the cords of such an engagement, it puts slowly forward. And when thus drawn, it will fall quickly off. Days of desolation beget resolves. Times of terror produce engagements, which the heart, the storm past, will wilily and wickedly seek to invade, to evade, excuse me. David suspected this cousinage in himself when he cries out, Oh, I have many good thoughts, but a naughty heart, many holy purposes, but a deceitful spirit. Thou hast cause, as a creator, not to believe the tender of my conscience, nor as a just God, the promise of submission. But I call to thy mercy to give assistance. Quote, Be surety for thy servant for good, unquote, for the performance of all good, I promise. And Hezekiah, in his sickness, was not without fear of this deceitfulness. Quote, o Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. Unquote. I shall never keep my word, that word which my lips have spoken, and I have none dare pass his word for me. Quote, Do thou, O Lord, undertake for me. Unquote. Number two, the helpfulness is undeniable. A heart from this engagement may fetch renewed strength continually. This engagement is a buckler of defense to arm us against Satan's enticement, is armor of proof to withstand the world's inducement. It makes us without fear of, uh, excuse me, it makes us without fear or failing stand upon our own ground and renew our courage like the eagle. Job was probably sometimes seduced with such foolish persuasions to courses not less foolish, but he yielded not. What helped him? Even his engagement. Quote, I have made a covenant with mine eyes. How then shall I look on a maid? Unquote. Constancy in good is well pleasing to God. Quote, if any draw back, his soul hath no pleasure in him. Unquote. Whatsoever then is needful for it or helpful to it, he both prescribes and approves. O oh, let us engage our hearts to this approachment, a duty enjoined, a sacrifice accepted. But there is one scripture that fully showeth the point, and the truth of it, in all particulars. Consider then, three things may seem necessary herein to be noted, the act, the approbation, and the reason. And here we have them all. Number one, the act, engaging, or the persons, the engagers of themselves. Thou hast avouched, set up God this day to be thy God not only in thy conscience by the act of faith, but even by the mouth thou hast uttered, uttered this, probably in some solemn league and covenant, quote, thou hast made to say, unquote, so much the Hebrew word imports. Number two, the approbation. And God answers thee accordingly. He hath avouched, set up thee to be his people, particularly in two privileges. First, to be his peculiar people, the people of his own proper possession, joined so high, united so near, that they are admitted to a participation of many heavenly privileges, the actions of the one being communicated to the other. Man's prayer is called God's. Quote, I will make them glad in the house of my prayer. Unquote. God's people called man's. Moses' people. Moses' law. So in the law of God, and in his law, that is, the righteous man's law. Secondly, to keep his commands. This seems rather to be a duty than a prerogative. Yet a prerogative it is for a Christian to be holy, obedient, righteous, both directly and accidentally. Number one, directly. The scripture teacheth so. The fruit of a Christian's being made free from sin is unto holiness. Quote, if you will fear the Lord and serve him, unquote. These are Samuel's words to the people. Quote, and not rebel, unquote. What then? What shall we have? Quote, then shall you and your king continue to follow the Lord, unquote. Solomon Setting down the recompense of a righteous person, saith, His reward shall be double, in himself and in his posterity. In himself, quote, he shall walk on in his integrity, unquote. In his posterity, quote, they shall be blessed after him, unquote. Number two, accidentally. Holiness is a privilege as well as a duty. It is a reward, a benefit to him who walks therein. 
it may and oft doth daunt their persecutors, than that otherwise would have taken away their lives. The heathens observe that the majestic presence of a prince hath dashed the boldness, and so prevented the execution of some villainous attempt by a base traitor against their persons. And Christians know that the power of holiness is able to dazzle the proudest spirits. Herod, saith the text, quote, feared John, unquote. And so a long while did him no hurt. And the emperor Adrian ceased his persecution against the Christians of his time when he understood of their holiness of life. So true it is both ways that the punishment of sin is sin and the reward of command is the, com uh, the and the reward of the command is the command. Both these privileges are again repeated and further are evidenced in the following verse, quote, Thou art his peculiar people, therefore will he make thee high above all nations, in praise, name, and honor, of more esteem than any, and thou keepest his commandments, and so he advanceth thee to be a holy people unto the Lord thy God, unquote. All this evidenceth God's approbation of an engaging heart. Number three, the reason and ground of God's approving this act, they are two. Number one, because the matter or duties to which by this bond the heart is tied are such as God directly observes with an approving eye. The particulars are three here specified and all elsewhere expressly subjected to this eye of God. Firstly, thou obligest thyself to walk in his ways in the practice of all the duties of the second table and upon such as depart from evil and do good upon such righteous ones the eyes of the Lord are fastened not his omniscient eye but his protecting, blessing eye, that eye, the seeing whereof, is of the same temper with the open ear following. Quote, his eye is upon the righteous, and his ear open to their cry. Unquote. That eye which stands in opposition to his face, which is against the wicked. Secondly, and to observe his ordinances and judgments reverently to practice all the duties of the first table to God, and to such also God casts his eye of respect. Quote, the eye of the Lord is upon those that fear him and that hope in his mercy. Unquote. Thirdly, and to hearken to the means of both, to hear his voice. Quote, when I counsel thee and instruct thee in the way that thou shouldest go, mine eye is upon thee, both to keep thee to do, uh, both to keep thee to it and to bless thee in it. Unquote. Number two. Because this engagement is a means to accomplish his promise, because thou hast avouched God, God hath avouched thee, and will do as he hath said, and again, as he hath said. The repetition whereof seems to argue contentedness in God, in that, by this avouchment, a way was opened for the accomplishment of his promise. Quote, God is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. Unquote. Delights when he can evidence himself to be righteous and just. For the laws and words of his mouth he will magnify and make honorable in the faithfulness of their accomplishment. Mercy, the acts of mercy, please him. God finds in a righteous man a rest of spirit, because by him he sends down a full influence of his favor upon the world. Quote, if the world knew, say some Hebrew doctors, of what worth a righteous man was, they would hedge him about with pearls. Unquote. His life is beneficial to all, even in some sort to God himself. For by him mercy is shown to the world. His death thereof is of great consequence, a greater affliction than those curses mentioned. Quote, I will make thy plagues wonderful. Thy heavens shall be brass. They shall distill no dew nor rain to water the earth. But I will do a marvelous thing, a marvelous and strange, a good man. A wise man shall be taken away, and I can send no more blessings upon you. Unquote. There remains not a heart engaged to whom I delight to approach, while such were. Mine eye was satisfied with seeing good, my heart was doing good. Now the one is removed, the other stopped. Oh, where is he that engageth his heart to approach to his God? Number three, the examining of the duty. This engagement being thus approved, and therefore to be entered on, let us a little examine the duty and mind two things. Number one, what particulars do engage us by that, excuse me, by what acts or thoughts that the heart become engaged? And number two, what hinders this engagement and stops our entrance thereupon? Number one, several and many ways doth the heart become engaged to God. 
No consideration can enter into our hearts. No occurrence ha happen in our life, in our lives, excuse me. But it offers reasons enforcing this duty. We are engaged to God by our being, by our receiving, by our doing. Mind either and acknowledge thyself engaged. First, our being what we are engageth us. Number one, that we are creatures and so not forgotten in the everlasting night of a not being, that we are men and not beasts, that we are Christians and not heathens. All are engagements. Number two, but our being thus and thus, men of gifts and parts, placed in such callings, qualified with such endowments, interested in such privileges, these are engagements indeed. Secondly, what do we have? Number one, everything we have received binds us, all the acts of God's providence over us, all the effects of God's goodness to us, health, food, callings, trades, friends, families, clothes, the service of the creatures, sun, rain, fruits of the earth, all all these are bonds. Number two, but especially, or more peculiar favors. Excuse me, but especially our more peculiar favors. Inward experience of his love and fruition of soul communication with him. Oh, who would not be engaged for this? Number three, thirdly, what we do, even our own actions, become our obligations, and that which comes from us binds us. Number one, our feeling prayers. Who dare practice what he prays against? A prayer against the power of sin obliges to walk in the power of that prayer. Neither will any lightly omit what but late as an evil he hath confessed to God. Number two, but especially, which is our present work, our solemn and serious vows, protestations, promises, our covenant and baptism, our particular covenants entered into, upon the apprehension of some approaching calamity, upon a day of humiliation, at a piercing sermon, or soul-searching prayer before a sacrament, or the like. If we have spoken with our lips, we cannot go back. We are engaged. Number two. As for such things that may hinder, we should both note and avoid. Firstly, ignorance. Quote, if thou knewest the gift of God, saith Christ to the Samaritan woman, Want of praying comes from want of knowing. Quote, have you received the Holy Ghost, unquote, was Paul's question. But the reply was, that could not be. Quote, we have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost or no, unquote. Have you engaged your souls in a solemn league? Let this be our query. And the answer will be, we have not so much as heard whether there be such a duty or no. Ignorance hinders this bond. Secondly, wretched profaneness, which slights and sets at naught all duties, ordinary, extraordinary, such mind sin, and the fulfilling thereof, and bind themselves to mischief with cords of vanity, whilst in the meantime they are contented to sit loose from God. Thirdly, wicked policy, both to avoid the taking and evade the keeping. Scruples of conscience shall be pretended by such as know not what conscience means. Scripture shall be alleged by such as are little versed therein. This sentence shall be thus explained. This replacement shall be thus pretended. All is but seemingly to stop the mouth of conscience that saith they must both make and pay vows unto God. Yet the willfully ignorant will neglect it. The wretchedly profane will condemn it. The wickedly politic will avoid it. So the heart shall be left to its own swing, open to all corruption that breaks in like a flood.